Welcome to Music Forever, a podcast by the New Horizons International Music Association. I am Irene Cohen. Florence Buschke plays bassoon in the New Horizons band at the Third Street Settlement Music School in Manhattan. Music was in her life from the moment she was born. She shares her family's musical journey and her love for the bassoon and many moments of serendipity in her life that got her involved in New Horizons music. We met at the New England Adult Music Camp in Maine in August 2023. How are you doing? I'm doing great. What's better than a, you know, week in Maine? You know, at music camp, you know, it's uh, this has been a real gift to be able to spend uh, a week here with people from all over the place and to just spend the whole day making music, even though there's a beautiful lake out there. I can't find time to get in the lake to swim or anything like that because all day, every day, it's music, music, music. Yeah, and that's just absolutely terrific. It is. It's, it's, it's a wonderful place and it is a wonderful atmosphere. We're actually sitting here on the deck of uh, Florence's cottage, uh, looking at the sunsets here in Maine. And it is a beautiful week and a beautiful day. So Florence, tell us a little bit more about how music got in your life. Well, I think I was born with it. I don't remember a, a day that went by without music in my house. It was always in my home and I really remember this that we had a uh, baby grand piano in our living room and uh, my parents had brought it from Europe. One of my earliest recollections is one night there was a cracking sound that really was like what happened? What happened? And it was the fact that this uh, piano keyboard had exploded can we say? And that was the end of the baby grand piano um i guess uh the voyage across the atlantic was a little too much for it but uh, my father could not be without a piano so they got an upright which i now have in my home and i'm sorry to say that i did not take good care of it and it's now just a piece of furniture yeah yeah so did you learn how to play the piano Oh, yes. Yes. We had to go for piano lessons and lived in an apartment building. And there was a lady on the first floor. As I even remember her name, Miss Clark. You know, we took piano lessons and she would always lean, lean on your shoulders and say, curve your fingers, curve your fingers. And I would always say, you know, inside my head, how am I supposed to curve my fingers if you're leaning on my shoulders? <laughs> but my parents felt that in order to have a true music education, you had to learn how to play the piano. Right. You know. So was I good at it? No. But also, as I said to you, you couldn't go and play chopsticks. So I had to learn that on my own outside. That was like forbidden, so to speak. Yes. To play chopsticks. But I still remember that book with Fur Elisa. Yes. <laughs> And I probably could still, you know, pick it out yes. on, on the piano. Yes. But no, music was always in my life. Wonderful. Did your parents play or other family members? Yeah. My uh, father played uh, the flute and he came from a family where his father and his two brothers had a trio of violin, viola, and cello. And my father was always the... What do they call that? The black sheep of the family. Right. And uh, so he was into woodwinds. Right. And that got me into woodwinds as well. Yeah. And it's funny. You think that the black sheep person is the person who plays the woodwind, um, where you and I are both woodwind players. Right. And we wouldn't think of ourselves as the black sheep of the family. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, you know, the the fact that he always chose to be unlike the rest of his family 
was a really good lesson in life that, you know, you can make your own way. Yes. And mm -hmm. find what you find enjoyable. He turned out to be always so supportive of anything that his children did. In fact, I once asked him, what was the best thing you ever did in your life? And without a moment's hesitation, have children. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just supported us in absolutely everything we wanted to do. And as a result, we sort of followed in his footsteps. For example, when, you know, as far as music is concerned, in the fourth grade, they had a program, they started a program in New York City Public Schools where they had an instrumental program from the fifth grade, you know, on. And you had to choose an instrument. And I chose the flute because my father played the flute. And then there were too many flutes and you sort of had to take, if you were going to take private lessons or whatever, if you didn't take from the person who was <clears throat> the teacher at the time, I mean, that could never be done today. Mm -hmm. But, <clears throat> you know, you were sort of out. So I said, well, I'd like to take something that, you know, is totally, not, that nobody else does. Yes. I love the sound of the bassoon, which I think I probably was very familiar with, not only from orchestras, which I had been introduced to, but through the Peter and the Wolf music mm -hmm. by Tchaikovsky. And I just loved the mellowness of the sound of the bassoon. Nobody played it and everybody thought, you know, what's a bassoon? You know, my father said, okay. And he went and did some research or whatever. And he really the, uh, the most prominent bassoon player who was starting at the beginning of his career. Yes. He would go with me into Manhattan from the time I was in the sixth grade. That's when I started the bassoon. There were other commonalities between this teacher and I used to take lessons at his in-laws apartment and uh, his in-laws were in a similar business that my father was in. So they became friends. And then in support, as my father always did, he took up the bassoon for a very short, you know, period of time. Wow. Yeah. And he used to call the uh, teacher a snake trauma. What? And because of what he was able to, you know, produce yes. in terms of the music, I played through my freshman year of college. This teacher said, I can't take your father's money anymore. And I said, it's okay. I hate to practice, <laughs> I said, but I love the lessons, yeah. and he knows it, yeah. you know, and it, it's okay with him, yeah. you know, because the lessons were, I, I just learned so much, and it was the music that came out yeah. was just magnificent, right? and it was mellow, mellow like the cello, and my sister was playing at the cello, which she had actually gotten from my father's brother, and uh, that cello eventually went to my uncle's granddaughter. I played till my freshman year of college, and then I dropped it for 18 years. That 18th year was like my first sabbatical from teaching in the high school in the New York City public school system. And I said, oh, you know, I think I'll go back to playing. And uh, I was embarrassed to call the teacher that I had abandoned. So my father called him up, you know, and he said, fine. But his career had gone very upscale to the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra and Juilliard. And, but he said, I'll hook you up with someone. And one of the people that he hooked me up with was a student of his at the same time that I was. I went rogue. This man went professional. I've quit again for another 20 years, and then I went back. Is very nice about, sure, come for a lesson or whatever. Very lucky, yeah. Yeah, and interestingly enough, which is 
to me more amazing than anything is that young people are playing the bassoon. It turns out that at the gym, there are a number of young people who are studying the bassoon. And one of the young men is making my reads now for me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's it's really, and we talk music. Yes. You know, yes. and uh, it's just absolutely wonderful. And it's an intergenerational experience. Oh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, bassoonists now are not doing just classical things. I went to one concert where there were five bassoonists and the four women and one man. The women walked out in high heels and had leopard skin pattern yeah. top, played the bassoon standing with the you know bassoon around uh, held up by a neck strap. First of all, they were standing in their high heels, yeah. but that they were all playing this wonderful jazz bassoon, five bassoons. Yes. In Manhattan, while I used to carry the bassoon on my back in a case, and lots of people ask you, you know, what's in that? And I'm a little hesitant to say what's in it. One day I was on the bus stop and uh, a woman said to me, uh, what's what's in that? What's in that? And was so insistent that I finally said, well, it's a bassoon. Oh, I played the bassoon in college. I was a performance major, whatever. Wow. Turns out that she lives on the same block as I do in Manhattan. And she also had not picked up her bassoon for years and years. And one day came over and we both found reeds that work and we played some duet. You, you just never know. No, you never know. And so you shared the information as to what is in your backpack, Back, or, right. or, you know, with the right person. That is amazing. <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about how you're going to draw us with the New Horizons band in Manhattan. I uh, was at the New York Public Library and I noticed that they had a sign up volunteer fair and I said maybe there's something that I might be interested in let me go check it out so I had 10 minutes a homeless woman tagged along with me we went into the fair this woman really could have used a lot of the services that were being offered as volunteer jobs and I went around and I saw that I knew about most of these organizations. So I left and she followed me into the elevator and she was, there's nothing there for me. And I was looking for this and that. And a very sophisticated woman was in the elevator and realized this conversation was going, so to speak, nowhere. Yeah. And said, oh, you know, I was at this fair I was representing an organization, but it was not volunteer organization. It was a music school, New Horizons, whatever. And my eyes just lit up. Mm -hmm. And this woman says to me, why do you play an instrument? I said, well, I haven't touched it for 20 years. And she said, Third Street Music School, Tuesdays and Thursdays, check it out. I took my heavy old bassoon case and my bassoon and I went over to Third Street Music School. Conductor said, is that a bassoon? And I said, yes. And that was it. And how many years ago was that? I would say 10, 12 years. Right. Started as a um, settlement house and they have a big, big music program. Kids, adults, private lessons, now very much trying to branch out into the greater community yeah. as best they can. They've been around, I think, over 100 years. It's uh, one, of, one of the early, and it's the Third Street Music School, by the way, that's on 11th Street. So I went back to lessons for a while, and I had a group to play with. And that was what was so important, because I don't want to just be home and practice 
We've also now turned it into where we have a little chamber group. And of course, the bassoon lends itself so well to chamber music. It's oh, that's bassoon. what I like best. Yeah. yeah. You've been now in, in the New Horizons program for 10 or 12 years. What would you like to tell somebody who says, you know, I'd, I'd like to start a musical instrument. I've never played one or I played one 50 years ago. How, how do I get started in something like this? There's nothing to be afraid of. Also, if you've played when you were younger or you know you're now an adult the same sort of anxieties that you had as a kid nobody's going to judge you and the best part of new horizons from what i've seen is your best is good enough people are willing to help because everybody wants to make music together and the only way you can do that is by helping each other and get better The experience of a camp, what what does it add to your music experience? I was very lucky that as a child, I went to a uh, sleepaway camp for seven years, for eight weeks mm -hmm. at a time. That was one of the greatest experiences of my life to this day. Anything that looks or feels like that kind of a community where it's not, so to speak, who you are, it's what you do, to do that with people that you don't know and in a week you come back year after year you might not see these people for a year mm -hmm. but it's like yesterday it's a, just a relaxing and other world the socializing aspect of right music making is a real it is and social it? right yeah. and yeah. it is social like and even making music together you have to work together you have to collaborate you have to cooperate You know, I tend to move towards the chamber music trio kind of groups, sure. but other people are into the jazz and Dixieland, Klezmer. It's your week. Do what you want with it. Yeah. And we got to know each other last year right. at this music camp, and I'm so glad we did. Yeah. And I was very also serendipitous yes. just with a conversation across the table, you know, oh, you're from New York. You know, Irene is from Canada. So it's international. Yeah. What can be better? We need more music in our life. It's the international language. Mm -hmm. People are here to harmonize, and that's the way it should be. That's exactly what it is. So we can harmonize in the rest of our lives, too. Exactly. Thanks for doing this. And the sun has it's done just, it. just setting. Just setting. Just setting. It's beautiful. Yes, it is. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would like to thank Florence for giving the interview. If you would like to find out more about Florence's New Horizons band in Manhattan, go to www.thirdstreet.nyc slash New Horizons. Music for this podcast by Mary Riddle, Swag on. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Music Forever. If you are interested to be interviewed for this podcast, please email us at nimapodcast at gmail.com. That is N-H-I-M-A podcast at gmail.com. See you next time.